been a eventful morning. Boy, I tell you, when you have a large family and everybody's getting ready for uh, the Lord's Day meeting, um, it can be pretty eventful. And uh, we've had a few things that come up. And so uh, we're uh, going to begin this time. And so uh, let's have prayer. And I'm going to go ahead and open up with prayer. We're still connecting some people for those that are I'm listening. Sorry. This is great and, the church. Uh, are you ready to join? Ask the Lord to help us with this day. Okay. okay, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We do pray to you bless as we uh, meet together virtually and individually. And Lord, I pray to you bless every here. And Lord, that you would help us. We pray that you'd uh, help Amy with these headaches. She gets uh, pretty frequently. We thank you that we're finding some remedies for that and that she's doing somewhat better, but we do pray that you just help her with that and encourage her as she is at home listening in. And Lord, we do pray that you would help us to connect everyone that wants to join us and that you would remove the interferences. And Lord, we thank you for your love, mercy, and grace. And we do pray that you bless this day in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have amen. the children come and sing their song first because our older uh, gentlemen and... Hello. Ladies are, uh, Hello. Is it, there was, this is Greg with the they're church. They're always ready. Okay. So they're going to gonna come. Okay. We're going to move this and you're going to stand right here. Hello. We're going to start here. now. You're going to stand right here. Okay. And I bet the little guys would be better in the front. Oh, yeah. That's always bad. All right. So they're going to sing and we're going to enjoy the service. Okay. Oh, yeah. Samuel, he's going to come and he's going to lead the rest of the music. All right, so you come, Sam. Yes, sir. We're going to start out with the congregational. Blessed be the name. It's in 159. 159 in our soul, uh, stirring songs and hymns. 159. Oh, praise to him who reigns above. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. 
the Zion Hill Trio, All the Way, My Savior Leads Me. Congregational, Only a Sinner, page 207, in the Soul Stirring Songs and Hymns, 207. Once I was fully 
next song is by the Calvary Quartet, Be Still My Soul. Around the 
People worked on that real hard this week, and what a blessing! All the songs, but uh, it's always nice to hear a new song. And okay, so uh, today we're going to look at the subject of salvation. I can't think of a greater subject to Amen. talk about in the Bible. Amen. But basically, the Bible says that the Son of Man cometh to seek and to save that which was lost, and so Jesus came. With this matter in mind, salvation. We begin the book of Genesis on this subject, and we find the promise of salvation. You have Adam and Eve in the garden, partaking of the forbidden fruit, and uh, there's consequences. And we find in verse 15, God promises salvation. He said, I will put enmity, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And what this is, is God is promising a seed or a Savior who would provide salvation. So this is the promised seed. Amen. And so, later on, you find the building of the ark. Well, the human race is going corrupt. And uh, the whole world's going to basically die out, except God raised up a man named Noah, and through that ark was the prolonging of the opportunity for salvation. And because Noah's seed continued on, and the whole world basically comes from the sons of Noah, uh, we have this opportunity of salvation. And then later on, we find God meeting with a man named Abraham in Genesis 12 and promises him that he would bless them that bless him and curse him that curseth him. And this is where Abraham's seed would be like salt in the earth. In that how the world deals with the seed of Abraham is how God's going to deal with the world. And individually, nations by nations can be dealt with. And that lifts the level, the bar, for righteousness in the world. When God corrects those that aren't with Him and He um, blesses those that are with Him, uh, this is for the preservation of the opportunity of salvation. And so we also find later on with uh, Moses, God gives a law. And that law is given in preparation for salvation. Because the Bible says the law is a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. And so we have the promise of salvation with Adam. We have the prolonging of the opportunity with Noah and the preservation of the opportunity with Abraham. And then you have God prepared the world to receive salvation, including the Jewish nation, by giving the law. He gave them a standard that they can't keep, and God knew that they couldn't keep it. So yes, that sir. he himself could come and keep the law and the standard for them. And so then God in Christ provided salvation. And that leads us to John chapter 3. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God has been at work on this plan of salvation for a long, long time. That's, true. That's right. Amen. That's true. And so he promised it. In Adam, he prolonged it with Noah, he preserved it with Abraham, he prepared it under the law with Moses, and he provided it with Christ. Amen. And so salvation, we find this by God's intervention in the garden, and his interruption of man's corruption through the flood of Noah, 
and his preservation through God's nation, Israel, and by setting a standard of perfection through Moses that the world can't keep. Nobody can live 100% perfect. But that's what God requires. So, He came from heaven, the Lord Jesus, to set the standard straight. That He's the only one that can keep the law, and He's the only one who was born without the seed of Adam. And so, in Adam we all die, but in Christ we all live. It's Christ alone. No one else can provide salvation. And so, That's right. John 3 gives the great exposition of Christ on how one can be saved. And so we find it takes a new birth in verse 3. Jesus taught on the subject of salvation. It's a sad thing that we could go through the Bible and not learn what Jesus taught on the subject. Something so important is the subject of how we're going to get to heaven. So Jesus taught Nicodemus, he said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so salvation takes a new birth. Salvation, we find in verse 5, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he said, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So salvation, according to Christ, takes a new birth yes, and a sir. spiritual reception. We've got to receive His Spirit in the person of Jesus Christ. We've got to accept Christ and then receive the Holy Spirit. And so this is, this is how God moves in and He occupies the life. And He is our perfection. He's our righteousness. He is everything we need. That's right. Yes. And so it takes a new birth. It takes spiritual reception. And this is by belief and trust in Christ's provision of this salvation. We've got to trust Christ as the one who provides it. We find that in verse number 12. It says, he's speaking to Nicodemus who's questioning him about this subject. And he says, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So, when it comes to salvation... It's not by natural inclination. Amen. It's not by what I naturally think on the subject. You know, human reasoning says, well, if God's good, if I'm good, I'll go to heaven. If, if I'm bad, I, I won't go to heaven. I'll go to hell. But it's not based on being good or bad. That's natural inclination. That's my natural tendency to think that I can be saved by some kind of performance. But remember, Jesus died thousands of years before you even came and he was buried and rose again to pay for your redemption and you can't contribute to that 2,000 year uh, plus work that Christ did in your behalf it's true and so it's not accomplished by uh, natural inclination he said art thou a master of Israel so Nicodemus was a very wise man and so it it doesn't come from wrong information. Nicodemus had this idea that, like many people, you can work on keeping the law and be saved by your performance of keeping the law. But Jesus said, Art thou master of Israel? Knowest not these things. In other words, he didn't know that it's by being born again. He yes, didn't know yes. it's by receiving the Spirit. He didn't know it's, true. it's by belief and trust in Christ's provision. And so, um, verse 12, he said, How shall you believe if I told you heavenly things? And then Jesus talks about his ascension and uh, coming from heaven and then going back to heaven in verse number 13. And so we find it's not accomplished by wrong information, this idea that I can work my way to heaven, and it's not by logical conclusion. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. You see, logical conclusion, conclusions do not 
lead us to salvation most of the time. Independent of the gospel. That's why we need the gospel to explain Amen. on the subject of salvation and clarity. And it's not by earthly wisdom. He said, if I've told you earthly things, you believe not. How shall you believe if I told you heavenly things? It's not by earthly wisdom. God's telling him heavenly things. And so, uh, it's not by human contribution. Verse 13, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And so, what it's saying here is, no human has ever done what Christ has done. Come from heaven to provide salvation. Amen. Went yes. back to heaven after he gave salvation. No man. But he, it says. But he. And so, Christ is the only one who can give us salvation. It says, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he. You see, Christ is the one that gives salvation. And so, in Acts 4.12... It says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So Christ is the only one who can provide us salvation. That's Amen. right. In 1 Timothy 2.5 it says, for there is one God and one mediator. Now mediator is a person between you and God. Between you, a human, and God the Father. And so it says there, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So Christ is the only mediator between you and God to bring peace where there was enmity. He's the one that can do that. In verse 6 of First Timothy 2, 5, it says, Who gave himself a ransom for all? So Christ paid our sin debt entirely. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So guess what? We're in that time, and I'm giving you testimony, and there's been thousands upon thousands before me, and there'll be many probably after me who testifies of this subject of salvation. And the salvation is exclusively... Through Christ. Yes. It's not by human contribution. It's the God man Christ. He's both God and man. You have to be both God and man to contribute to salvation. Well, none of us can do that. So he's the only provider of salvation. Jesus taught that himself in John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Who said that? Jesus saith unto him. I am the way. Jesus said he's the way. The truth and the light. Then these next words. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. And so Jesus is the only provider of salvation. It's by one person. It's not by our contribution. We can't add to salvation. And so... We can't make a single contribution to our salvation. According to the book of Titus, this is all through the Bible. So it's very clear. Titus 3, 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, yes, He saved us. Amen. So this is a work of God. Salvation is a work of God. Creation is a work of God. Yes, sir. Salvation is a new creation. Amen. And this is a work of God. And it says, not of yourselves, in, he, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So, Titus says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And so this washing that takes place, God washes a sinner in the blood of the Lamb. Christ is the Lamb of God, and He washes us in His blood. Now that, that's kind of hard to conceive if you've never heard it before, but He washes us in His blood that He gave as a ransom. It's called precious blood. And the Bible says we were redeemed not with corruptible things, 
but incor incorruptible by the precious blood of Christ. And so this is a grace matter. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace. Now grace is God giving you something you don't deserve and you cannot earn. For by grace are you saved through faith. It says, not of yourselves. Now again, we cannot make any contribution to our salvation. That's it's right. not of yourselves, it says. It is the gift of God. In a true gift, you do not make a contribution. That's true. Amen. If it's a true gift, it, otherwise, you know, it, it would be earned. And so it says, not of yourselves, it is gift of God, not of works. No contribution to our salvation. It's not by our works that we've done, lest any man should boast. And so God gave us a salvation. We can make no contribution and we can boast nothing concerning salvation. And then Romans 6.23, it says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and brought death. But the gift of God, Christ died for sinners, and he offers us life. Amen. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we find salvation is not by works. It's by grace. It's a gift. And it's by believing. It's by believing. John chapter 3, verse 15. It says, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So we believe that God has the remedy. Now, if you knew of a doctor, and that doctor had the remedy for coronavirus, and he knew he had that remedy, he knew he had it, and he paid dearly to get it. Let's suppose that um, the antibodies were in his own son, but his son had to die in order to give you the antibodies. Do you think that that doctor would withhold that remedy from the world? If he had that remedy? If his son had to die to make that remedy available? Do you think that doctor would hide it from the world? Do you think that doctor would want to give it to the world? Do you think the doctor would care whether that person was a terrible murderer or adulterer or somebody did some terrible evil deed? You think he would care and say, no, you're a murderer, you can't have that. But no, I think that doctor would want everybody that he possibly could to be healed by the remedy for the coronavirus. Don't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, why do we think that God's hesitant to offer salvation and because somebody has done this or done that, he won't give them salvation? That's right. God paid a great deal. His mm -hmm. son had to die. And, he's, and what we have is worse than coronavirus. We've got... The sickness of sin and the remedy is eternal death and separation from God forever. And, and God doesn't, and our remedy restores the sinner, forgives the murder, cleanses the adulterer. He does whatever is needed for the remedy. It doesn't matter what the sickness is. He has the cure. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Christ our Lord. And so it's a gift. Amen. Amen. It's not by works. It's by grace. It's a gift. And it's by believing. John 3.15 Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. In that great verse, John 3.16 For God so loved the world. You see, God, he's not like a doctor with a remedy who doesn't know the individual that's getting the remedy. We've got people working in labs all around the world trying to find a remedy for coronavirus, find a vaccine. But they won't know who's taking the, the remedy. But God personally knows every individual who needs salvation, and He loves them. Yes, sir. That He gave His only Son purposefully that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so it says, believeth. So it's by believing. Again, Verse 18, he that believeth on him, on him is not condemned. So God gives a simple way of salvation by believing. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So if somebody doesn't take the coronavirus vaccine, 
and they catch the coronavirus, they're going to die many, many times. Uh, let's suppose it's worse than coronavirus. Let's say it, it's uh, the most hideous disease that ever known to man. If he doesn't take the serum, he's going to die. But God made a simple way of believing. And it says, notice, he that believeth on him is not condemned. That means like taking the serum. But he that believeth not, that's he that doesn't take it or believe it, is condemned already because he has not believed that salvation's available. Just like a serum would be available and someone wouldn't take it. And so, salvation. We looked at Jesus' method of salvation. By a new birth. We find it's by not by works, it's by grace. It's a gift. It's by believing. And if it really takes place, it has some evidence of real change. If it's really taking place, we don't change our life in order to be savable. No more Amen. than a drowning man drives himself off in order for him to be rescued. That's right. And so it's evidenced by real change. John 3.19, again, And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And so the evidence, we must come out of the dark into the light. Yes. Amen? Amen? There's an old song. It's, I saw the light, I saw the light. Well, we need to see the light. <laughs> and come out of the darkness into the light. And the Bible says men love darkness. So there's a change of heart. If real salvation is taking place, there's a change of heart. And it says men love darkness rather than the light. So they no longer love the dark. Amen. Yes, there are certain nocturnal creatures that love the night. And there's other creatures that love the light. There's two different makeup of these creatures. And so the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. It's like going from a nocturnal creature to a creature that lives in the light. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's right. Yes. And so, now I'm not saying nocturnal creatures are evil, but I'm saying people that, there's a comparative of people that love darkness. Yes. And there's people that love light. And when we come to Christ, He changes our heart so that we will love the light. And so we, and again, we, we stop doing evil. There's not a desire to do evil. Now, the definition of evil is out of submission to God. See, that's what the devil, he was out of submission to God. And so, a lack of submission or being in our place before God, and no matter how you look at it, that's the definition of evil. And so, that's the, that's the root, okay? The fruit is what everybody calls evil. Well, he lied to me, or this or that or whatever. But the definition is out of submission to God. And so, we stop doing evil, we change kingdoms when we're saved. And, and it's evident. Verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. But he that cometh to the light, uh, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that are wrought in God. And so, we, uh, we stop doing evil, and we find there's a change. We change kingdoms. The kingdom of light. Except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. And so God is light. In him is no darkness at all. Yes, that's right. And so we want to do right when you come to the light. And if somebody doesn't want to do right, well, you know, if it looks like a frog, jumps like a frog, it's slimy like a frog, and uh, croaks like a frog. What do you think it is? What do you think it is, Elizabeth? It's a frog. It's a frog. And so, if he looks like a sinner, walks like a sinner, talks like a sinner. Now, we know we're sinners by nature, but if he lives like a sinner, guess what he is? Mm -hmm. He's more likely lost. And so, uh, if you don't see any change, 
And so all through the Bible, we stop doing evil. Evidenced by real change. Ephesians chapter 2, it says, In times past, ye walked according to the course of this world. So the world's no longer leading the Christian and dictating his direction. According to the prince of the power of the air. That's the devil. So we're not following the stranger, we're following the shepherd. The spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience. We're not living disobedient. We're living obedient to God. And guess what? That'll make you uh, a good citizen. That's right. In your home. And, and, and make a good wife and a good husband or a good child. When real salvation takes place. Yes. And yes, so sir. when you're raising a child before they've been redeemed and really saved, that's a challenge. Yeah. Because you're trying to legislate righteousness. That's impossible. There has to be a real change inside. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.17 We find this changed life is mentioned. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Aren't you glad that God doesn't drag up the old past when you give your future to Him and accept His salvation? Yes. Amen. He doesn't drag up the old, dredge up the past. You know, our, That's right. uh, the Bible says there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And now unto him that's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless. God is able to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. How Amen. can he do that? Yes, sir. He does it by his perfect salvation. Amen. Yes, that's right. You see, Adam and Eve put on a new set of clothes. First they tried fig leaves. That was a picture of their works. But God said, no, those won't work. And so they put on His clothes. Amen. And God slew an animal, I believe it was a lamb, and took that skins from that lamb and they covered with skins. And we've been clothing ourselves ever since. Amen. And so it must be <clears throat> correctly understood this salvation we find man's complete and utter failure at perfection mm -hmm. you see God said now to the Jew he said now here's here's some animals I don't want you to eat have you ever thought about how God gave them animals that taste really good okay like pork I, now you may not like pork but you can't go by if you're hungry and you smell bacon cooking, I guarantee you, you you'll, your mouth will water. Even if you don't like pork, okay? <laughs> and so, um, so there's a there's a temptation that goes with things that taste good. Um, you take um, things that God uh, tells us not to do. You know, why does the world do them? Because they're fun, or they feel good. And so all these things that are fun or feel good are things that God says don't do. And when man finds himself doing them, he sinned against God and then he knows he needs salvation. Well, why God make it that way? So we would want and know we need salvation. Yes, yes. sir. That's right. And so Christ, we find man's complete failure at salvation. And Christ's total success by substitution. Mm -hmm. His total success. I mean, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, His miracle ministry summarized by the resurrection, is a total success. Yes. That's right. Perfect. And so, He's a risen Savior today. And, and He's coming again. And we find that He, as God and man, who identifies with you and 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 is both a deity and humanity wrapped in one hu one being he can provide salvation the bible says for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin so christ took our sin upon himself that we might be made righteousness of god in him so he took our sin that's drawn from our nature 
which which uh, is a failure, and paid the full price for our redemption, and then he in turn gives us his nature, and which is perfection through salvation. And that nature is your guarantee of eternal life from the moment you receive him for the rest of your life. It's your guarantee. When you're born into a family, a human family, you you're there's a birth that takes place and you get old enough to know it. <clears throat> you attribute that birth to your parents and nothing can change the fact that you were born. No matter what you do, you can change everything and that's not going to change the fact you were born. Amen. But I'll tell you what. God does a superior birth to man. Mm -hmm. And nothing can change when you're born again. Nothing can change it. You get a new nature like unto Him. John 1.12 says, But as many as receive Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. And so, salvation takes personal reception. Because Christ died for all doesn't mean everybody's going to heaven. We have to personally come to Him and receive the remedy of salvation for our sin. As many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. So this takes a personal reception. We have to receive Him. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So Christ knocks on our heart's door, and He said, If any man hear my voice, and open the door, and that includes women, boys, girls, if any man hear my voice, open the door, I will come into him. Now look at that, I will come in. God moves in, and the devil moves out. Yes, sir. And will sup with him, and he with me. And so in closing, the Bible is a book about salvation. Yes, sir. It's about God's intervention in the garden, Interruption of corruption by the flood. It's about preservation of nations by Abraham's covenant and his law with Moses setting the standard of perfection which is impossible to keep perfectly. And Christ's personal visitation as God and man to be our substitutionary lamb by his death on the cross and his resurrection proving that payment is complete and in full and put to your account the moment you receive Him as your personal Savior. And it calls us to believe and receive Him. Mm -hmm. To believe and receive Him. This message of salvation. And so knowing our failure at perfection, we see God's grace is our only provision. And His blood is our only satisfaction that our sins are paid in full. And so today, I'd like to invite you, if you've never received salvation, to receive His salvation. By calling on the name of the Lord. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, knowing I cannot save myself, and that Christ died for me and paid for my Attempts at perfection. He paid for that. And all the sin, when I failed, when I didn't meet that standard, He paid for it. And I believe in His resurrection, His death, that He paid for it, His resurrection, that it's proof, and I call on Him, get on my knees and call on Him, and ask Him for this gift. Then God will save me. And that happened to me in 1980. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I, the, the deacon next to me, he said, do you believe you're a sinner? I said, I know I'm a sinner. You do you believe Christ died for your sins? I said, I do believe he died for my sins. Would you like to receive him? I said, I sure would. He said, well, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I said, well, I want to do that. He said, well, in the best words you know how, you call on him right now and ask him to save you. And I did. And I got up, and I felt the burden of sin lifted off my shoulders, and I got up a different person. Yeah. And so that's what happens to you. You'll be different when salvation comes. And I want to tell you, life was better. I was happier. 
uh, food tastes better. I mean, uh, I looked out, the grass looked greener, the trees were prettier, the sunshine, and the sunset always was more beautiful. I mean, everything was better. And I learned about prayers being heard and answered, and, uh, and I love the Bible. And so God's changed me, and he'll change you too if you never okay. receive it. And so at this time, we're going to ask the young people to come sing that song again, and um, that new song that they sing. I don't even know the name of it, but it's a good song. And so as they sing, maybe you'd like to accept the Lord by getting on your knees and calling on you for salvation. As they sing, you can do that at home, you can do it anywhere. Somebody can be, you know, eventually this broadcast, they can be on a plane or train or boat or, or uh, whatever, moped, going down the road, listening to their, their tweet and come to Christ. That'd be great. I wonder how many people got saved riding down the road on a moped. Probably not too many. All right, so uh, this time they're going to sing. Hope it's a blessing. So we're thankful for you all and thankful for this opportunity. Um, and so at this time, we'll have a word of prayer. Afterwards, we'll just end the uh, Zoom and telephone calls. And then uh, you feel free to text or, or, or call afterwards. And so at this time, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for salvation. Lord, that you in grace and in kindness have extended to us a way that we could have eternal life even though we do not deserve it, Lord, and we're so thankful. Pray, Lord, for those who have never experienced salvation, Lord, that you impress upon their hearts the importance and, and the necessity of receiving your Son as their personal Lord and Savior. Uh, Lord, we'll thank you. We love you. Pray that you bless and, and help each one. And until we meet again, Lord, we look to you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.